Manhattan Institute. His research interests include microeconomic theory and the economic effects of government regulations. Meyer, who publishes regularly, presents on the need for a moral foundation for free markets as a regular contributor at the Washington Examiner, The Federalist, Forbes.com, Townhall.com, Real Clear Energy, E21, and City Journal. He is a co-author with Diana Furtgoth Roth of Disinherited, How Washington is Betraying America's Young. Meyer's research has been featured in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Yahoo Finance, the National Review, Real Clear Politics, Los Angeles Times, and the New York Post. He is interviewed frequently on radio and TV, including BBC, World Service, Fox News, and NPR. Meyer holds a BS in finance and a minor in philosophy of law from St. John's University. Before joining MI, he was a research assistant for political philosopher Douglas Rasmussen. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jared Meyer. Right, well, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, in order, I guess on a Monday evening, at least there's no Monday night football for me to compete with. But I'm going to do my best to make sure this is worth your time. And I want to, uh, I hope that all of you are looking forward to participating because I'm going to keep the lecture pretty short. And I've heard a lot about Hillsdale. I've had a lot of interns from Hillsdale and they've always impressed me. So I want some really good questions and I don't want just silence when we get to the Q&A part. But the whole point of my talk today is I'm going to let you know that, contrary to what Bernie Sanders says, actually the government isn't going to be able to fix everything that young people are currently facing. I mean, I agree with Bernie Sanders. We have terrible unemployment prospects for young people. They're not quite as high as he says. I don't know where he gets his numbers, but they are very bad, uh, much higher in, in history. We have also crushing student loan debt. Uh, it's very hard. We're not even buying houses. I don't even own a car. I'm 25. I should have a car by now. There's a lot of things that millennials aren't doing, and it comes back to they're facing a bad economic situation. But again, government is not the savior in this, and more often than not, it's government policy that's actually contributing to the problems that millennials are facing. So my co-author, uh, Diana, and I I, she had the idea to write a book about how young people are getting the short end of the policy stick. And I was talking about it with her, and I saw an article in Rolling Stone, which I still don't know why I re read Rolling Stone, but there was an article by Jesse Meyerson, and it went through and it said the same thing as Bernie Sanders, uh, except this was about two years ago, before everyone was feeling the burn. But he laid out everything that was going on with young people. Again, crushing debt low employment <coughs> prospects, really facing a bleak economic situation. And I was like, yeah, I could get on board with this. Then he decided to go to how he wanted to fix it. He said, first of all, let's just abolish private property and make everything publicly owned. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, okay, let's start out reasonable. <laughs> then next he said, you know what, let's guarantee everyone a job. And if they don't want to work, guarantee everyone an income. Next, let's make higher education free for your whole life. And he kept going on and on in these proposals. I'm like, there is another side to this story. So what Diana and I tried to do through only 150 pages, because my publisher said no one would read the book if it was longer than that, uh, is give the other side to this story. Show how on a, a very a wide variety of issues, government policy is making your lives worse. So you can't start by talking about, uh, or talking about how government's working against young people's interests without looking at our national debt. And I know this is the boringest topic I'm going to cover tonight, but I'm going to try to show you just how bad it is for your future. So you constantly hear the number $19 trillion tossed around for our national debt. Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you look at what we've promised for our entitlement programs, think Social Security and Medicare, we're actually over $200 trillion in debt if you look at what we've promised versus what's projected to come in. And I know this is a huge number. I have no idea what you know, $200 trillion bills will look like stacked up. But to try to put this into uh, more easy to understand terms, if we wanted to write America's fiscal situations right now, we would either have to increase all federal taxes across the board by 57%, or we could cut all government spending, excluding our ballooning interest payment on the debt, by 37%. So this means we're either going to be paying the same amount for far fewer government services, 
or we're going to be paying a lot more for the same level of services that our parents and grandparents currently enjoy. And I don't know, uh, if any of you are, do any of you work right now or have a part-time job? I'm not sure if you notice on your paycheck, there's a part that comes out for Social Security and Medicare. And if you count what your employer is also paying in, it's about 15% of your paycheck are going to Social Security and Medicare right now. Well, if nothing changes, by the time we're in our prime earnings years, we're going to be paying over 30% of our income just to Social Security and Medicare. So that's before you pay your rent, before you pay your car payment, your state and local taxes, your federal income taxes, you're going to be losing almost a third of your hard-earned income to two programs that really are not going to be there for you to the same level that they are for today's retirees. So if we look at it in Social Security in 2034, so this is not that far off now. People used to be able to say, this is way in the future, we can fix this soon. I mean, this is less than 20 years. Social Security is only going to be able to pay out about 70% of what it's promised us. And if we look at Medicare, by 2030, the fund's going to be broke. And that means they're going to have to start rationing care, or meaning that you can't get the health care that you'll need when you're uh, retired. And an important thing to keep in mind, because during the Republican debate as well, uh, unfortunately, entitlement spending has been a bipartisan priority. We had Mike Huckabee during one of the debates saying that, you know, these are promises we made to seniors. They've earned every cent of these entitlements, and we need to keep meeting these promises. All we just need to do is, you know, get some more innovation in healthcare and we'll be fine. Well, I agree we could use some innovation in healthcare, but he's ignoring the major problem with the programs which are that today's retirees are getting far more than they paid into the system. And I had this a really awkward conversation with my grandpa when I told him I was writing a book on how old people are screwing over young people. <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean? I work, you know, my whole career as an airline mechanic. I deserve all my Social Security and Medicare. I was like, grandpa, you've had two knee replacements and back surgery. Those were not cheap, and you haven't paid even close to what you've cost in Medicare. And in fact, he's by no means rare. If we look at the average senior who retired between 2000 and 2010, they're receiving up to $7 more, or $7 for every dollar they paid into Medicare. And that's even accounting for, let's say, if we let them keep their money and invest it privately to get returns. So they're getting far more than they paid in. Yet, instead of confronting this reality, politicians just continually place more and more costs on Americans who are either too young to vote or not even born yet. And one other point to keep in mind for all the inequality warriors out there uh, is that Social Security and Medicare aren't just taking money from the young to give to the old, it's taking money from the poor to give to the wealthy. The average household headed by someone 65 years and older, so think a retiree, has almost 50 times the wealth of an average household headed by someone 35 years or younger. And you might say, yeah, that makes sense. People have worked their whole careers. They've been able to save up money. Obviously, they're going to have more wealth. Well, back in the mid-1980s, this was 10 to 1. So the ratio has increased from 10 to 1 to now 50 to 1, which shows that today's retirees, they're facing a much different system than retirees in the 30s or 70s when Social Security and, or 60s when Medicare was put into place. And this is great. We should celebrate longer life expectancy and higher standards of living among seniors, but these programs need to adjust to fit changing 21st century realities. We cannot continue to delay reform or do what Bernie Sanders says and actually expand Social Security when it's putting this much of a burden on our future economic success. So we can go into all these topics again when I get to the end, but I want to move on to one other uh, entitlement the Affordable Care Act. So I'm going to leave everything else out. I'm not going to talk about any of the other pros or cons of the Affordable Care Act, but I just want to look at how it blatantly takes the cost of health care and shifts it from people in their prime earning years to young people. So in the letter of the law, you can look this up, it's clearly in there because it's a critical feature of the Affordable Care Act. A young, healthy person cannot pay less than one-third of what an older person has to pay. So before the law went into place, it was about 1 to 5, 1 to 6 was the ratio. The only way to get this in compliance with the law was to raise costs for people at the bottom, so raise health care costs for young, healthy people. And that's exactly what happened. In the first year under the Affordable Care Act, premiums for 27-year-old males shot up over 90%. 
they had to raise our cost again to help people in their 50s pay less in healthcare. And this was vital to the act because if you didn't get young healthy people to sign up, quickly the premiums would start going out of control. They keep growing as only older uh, people who tend to have higher health care costs would sign up. So right now, we have people under 30 only spend an average of $600 a year on health care, yet they're being forced to buy plans that before subsidies cost almost $2,000 in, in uh, premiums and they have a $3,000 deductible. So we're being forced into plans that we don't need to keep health care costs down for people who can actually afford to pay them. So that was really the first part of the book. We wanted to look at entitlement spending, government debt, and how that contributes to putting a barrier on young people's future success. But the second part of the book, we looked at education. And we started with K through 12. So right now, America's school system, you constantly hear how it's stagnating, how since the 70s, our outcomes have pretty much stayed flat while the rest of the world has shot past us. And a lot of people, when I do debates on this in DC, all people say, no, we just need to spend more money on education. That's how we're going to get a better school system. Well, we already spend more than any other country in the world per student, which is $13,000 a year, and it's much higher than it was in the past. So somehow, people are defending the status quo. They're saying that these $13,000 we're spending each year on a student through K-12, through it needs to be raised. Well, I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is for far too long, our education system has become, it's been inflexible. It hasn't changed to meet students' needs. And a major reason behind this is the in undue influence that teachers' unions have over current education policy. And we can see the stark contrast that has come up with movements towards greater school choice which really, the way to define the school choice uh, proposals are thinking that the money we're already spending, again, that $13,000 a year on a student, let's have that money actually follow the student rather than following a brick building. So currently, let's say you're born in a zip code that has a low income and you have to go to one neighborhood school. What, uh, what people are talking about when they're talking about reforming America's K-12 system is allowing this funding to follow students so we can bring competition to the education system. And this has had a lot of success. We've seen Nevada introduce a universal school choice where every student and parent are able to pick what works best uh, for their needs. And what it's done is create, again, competition that has led to better outcomes. And a lot of people, when you're doing debates on school choice, it gets pretty heated because uh, people are worried that we're going to have schools closed down or students aren't going to be able to have the education opportunities that they currently do. And one of the common critiques I get is if we have school choice, schools are going to close down. I'm like, that's exactly the point. If a school's not serving its students' needs and not preparing them uh, for an educated future, it needs to close down. But because the funding follows students now, there will be incentives for more innovative schools to open up, and we can improve education outcomes that way. We saw this in New York City, because uh, New York City has a very long waiting list for charter schools, which are another form of, they're public schools, but they're able to operate outside of the unions. And New York City has a very long waiting list, because parents want what's best for their kids. But if you looked at students who both of them apply, or everyone who applied for a charter school then looked at their education outcomes a few years later. The ones who got in uh, far outperformed the ones who did. So this takes away any question of selection bias of people who are applying for the schools. And it shows that if we can just create a more flexible education system, it's going to lead for a lot better outcomes. But again, teachers unions are more worried about protecting the status quo rather than embracing innovation. But something a little more pressing than K-12 through education for all of you is student loan debt from college. So that's the next topic we wanted to focus on. And I've done a few debates with you know, baby boomers where they've said millennials are just complaining. I had student loan debt and I just worked during summers and was able to pay it off. But we're not, we are right when we say that this is worse than it's ever been. Right now, seven out of every 10 graduating seniors are going to not only pick up a diploma when they walk across the stage, but an average of $30,000 in student loan debt. This is about three times as high as it was in the early 1990s. 
But we hear plenty of proposals from politicians on both sides of the aisle on how to fix this. At least they're acknowledging that our over $1 trillion in student loan debt is a problem. But unfortunately, I haven't heard a single one actually address the reason why we've gotten to where we are today. And that is the government's student loan programs. So it's kind of counterintuitive when you first think about it, that a program meant to hold down the costs of college actually ends up increasing the costs. But everyone from the New York Federal Reserve to the US Treasury Department to many economists have found that this is exactly what's happening. And the way to think about it is right now, the federal government essentially writes a blank check to schools saying, hey, it doesn't matter how much you increase your tuition, because how we figure out how much we're going to give a student is based on how much it costs to go to that school. So we have schools that all they've been doing is increasing tuition year after year, and the federal government is picking up the difference. Unfortunately, young people aren't really taking these costs into account, and that's how they end up with the level of debt we've seen. But let's say if someone goes into a four-year college and they don't graduate, there's no skin off the school's back. They can just bring in another misled freshman the following year and get the same government funding that they were before. But I think it's very problematic when we're creating a system that pushes people into a four-year college right after high school, acting as if that's the best decision for everyone in America. Unfortunately, it isn't, because only four in 10 high school freshmen will graduate within four years, and only six in 10 will graduate within six years. So when we are saying we just need to push more students into college, we're just going to leave a lot more people who only come out with a debt and they don't come out with a degree. And if we look at what happens uh, right now with pushes for free college, again, I call that kind of putting a band-aid over the problem. They're not addressing the real reason why college uh, tuition is increasing. But if we're going to give more money to get people to go to school and they don't end up graduating, that's not going to lead to a better workforce, and it's not an investment in the traditional sense of the word, how we usually treat higher ed. And right now, uh, also, people who graduate school, let's say you are one of the six in 10 who end up graduating within six years, and then 40% of those graduates end up working in a job that doesn't even require a college degree. So putting that math together, it means one in every three high school uh, or college senior, or freshman, sorry, one in every three college freshmen will end up in a job that requires a college degree. So simply shuffling more people into a system that leaves them with little more than student loan debt is not the best way to move forward. And you would think that students who owed maybe $100,000 in student loan debt would have much higher default rates than those who owed maybe $5,000. But it turns out it's exactly the opposite. People who owe under $10,000 in debt have twice as high of a default rate as those who owe over $100,000. And this shows the major barriers that student loan debt places on people who maybe go in, take college classes for a year, then have to withdraw. They're left with nothing but debt. So what we need to do, and we'll get into solutions a lot more later, but what we need to do is put some accountability for these schools. If they're going to be taking advantage of a federal program that just drives up the cost of their tuition, if someone isn't able to graduate or isn't able to find a job after, the schools need to be on the hook for paying some of that. And we see some people talking about this right now. Uh, Marco Rubio has a proposal, and Jeb Bush, before he dropped out, he had a similar proposal. So we're seeing that America's colleges, right now, they have been taking advantage of a program to just continually increase their costs. So the middle section was on education, and then the last section, again, after entitlements, education, we decided to move to employment. And this is what I think is the most interesting area, because there are just blatant government acts that are protecting older established interests and keeping young people out of work. Because you would think, after we're born into debt, we go through an education system where we don't get that great of an education, we're saddled with student loan debt, at least the government would make it easy for us to find a job. But unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. And the first area I want to focus on is occupational licensing. How many of you have ever heard of occupational licensing before? OK, good, so more than at usual. Uh, this is a topic that kind of flies under the radar. You hear about the minimum wage all the time. You hear about unions constantly. But one of the areas that puts a lot of promising career paths out of reach for young people is really never talked about. 
So what occupational licensing is, is effectively a government permission slip you have to get to work. And this goes for almost uh, four out of every 10 workers are going to have to get this to work. And back in the 1950s, it was about one in 20. So people think of doctors, lawyers, accountants, financial planners, people like that, and they're like, yeah, licensing makes sense. We need people to uh, make sure that they're trained in certain standards to protect the public. But today, that's not the case. We've moved far beyond that. <coughs> we have everything from florists to interior designers to door repairmen, the list goes on and on, tree trimmers of people who have to go and cannot start work unless if they spend a lot of time and a lot of money getting government's permission to do so. And I want to share a story to show just how this affects young people. So there was an Arizona teenager named Christian All, and apparently in Arizona, I don't know if any of you are from the Southwest, there's a problem called roof rats, where they go and I guess they make holes in your roof. It's, it's, I don't know, it sounds terrifying. But Christian, he was an entrepreneurial teen, and he realized he could make some money. He went out to his garage, saw that he had a ladder, chicken wire, and a staple gun, and thought if I could just get up on the roof and cover these holes, the problem would go away. And surprisingly, it did. Uh, business was booming for Christian because he only charged about 30 bucks to do this service that professional pest control companies charge thousands of dollars for. So business was going great, it was all fun, <laughs> And then the government showed up and told him that unless if he got a pest control license, he would not be allowed to work anymore. But think about how little sense this makes. He wasn't using any dangerous chemicals or anything that could warrant having to take classes in chemistry and consumer safety. He was, again, only using a ladder, chicken wire, and a staple gun. Thankfully, the Institute for Justice, which is a nonprofit legal defense firm that tries to fight for people's right to work, they stepped in and Christian was allowed to keep his business going. But all throughout the economy, there are thousands of young entrepreneurs, if not hundreds of thousands, who aren't able to get into a career path because it costs too much. And this isn't just a case of government bureaucrats going a little crazy and extending it to things that have nothing to do with safety. It is explicitly established businesses putting in these regulations, using the government to keep out new competition. And we see this right now in the popular case of Uber versus taxis. Think about what the taxis are doing right now. In some cities, you have to get a license to be a driver, but they're also putting in place anti-competitive regulations, things that say you can't operate if you're an Uber car because taxis deserve special treatment. This is something that's gone on all throughout the economy. And again, it has little connection to public safety, even though that's how it's always justified. Just for one more example, uh, let's look at interior designers, which is one of my favorite ones to talk about. So interior designers are only licensed in three states and DC. So I'm surprised we're able to be in this room right now because Michigan is not one of the states. So if other states think that it, it, interior designers pose a big enough danger to the public, that they have to spend an average of six years getting government permission to work, yet all the other states were able to, were perfectly fine. Like, I don't know, I, I don't know, maybe any of you have heard of someone who's died from mismatched pillows or ugly drapes, but I just don't see that happening. And something that shows just how hypocritical government is on this is that President Obama, when he moved into the White House, he wanted to have a California designer come in and set up the Oval Office for him. Well, uh, it turns out the California designer he picked wasn't licensed by the city of, uh, by the District of Columbia. Yet they still let him come and work on the most protected man in the world's office. So if I say an unlicensed designer is safe enough for President Obama, it's safe enough for the rest of us. They shouldn't have to spend six years getting government permission to work. And keep in mind, uh, EMTs who are literally holding lives in their hands, there's a much better argument for public safety there. They only have to spend an average of about a month getting government permission. So this just shows to what extent businesses and government will go to to protect established interests at the expense of young people. So the next topic I want to talk about is the minimum wage. And this is one, it's, it's become a very controversial topic in the public. It's been completely politicized. But one thing that really bothers me is when you hear people talking about the minimum wage or increasing it to $15 an hour, they act as if there will be zero negative consequences. And it's hard for me to understand how they can argue this. 
and say that if we raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, we're not going to take away any economic opportunity from young people. All I have to do is look back at my own experience. I know when I started washing dishes at a Thai restaurant for like $4 an hour under the table, I was barely worth that. There is no way if they raised a minimum wage to $15 an hour that a local restaurant was going to take a chance on me, you know, a 14-year-old who had no work experience, when they could hire someone who had much more experience. So you constantly hear the minimum wage uh, defended also in the idea that it must be impossible to raise a family on the minimum wage. And I couldn't agree. I don't know how people could raise a family on the minimum wage, must let's less support themselves. But thankfully, when it comes to minimum wage earners, this is the exception, not the norm. Over half of minimum wage workers are under 25, and two-thirds of workers, uh, minimum wage earners work part-time. So the case that this is uh, most minimum wage earners are a single mother trying to support a family, while that is true in some cases, it is, again, the exception, not the norm. And we can see this also in the statistic of the median household income that has a minimum wage earner in the household. You might think, oh, it's got to be about $20,000 uh, because they don't make that much money. Well, it turns out it's actually $53,000 is the median household income for a household that has a minimum wage worker. A lot of the times, these are young workers, these are teenagers, they're people who are working part-time as a secondary earner. So we have to keep in mind, though it sounds nice to want to raise the minimum wage, and who wouldn't want to give their neighbors a raise, it's not that simple. And it comes with trade-offs. Most, Like I said, most economists have found that obviously it's going to decrease employment for young people, some people will get a raise, and then the question is, is, is if this trade-off makes sense. But my argument would be, when we're trying to take away economic opportunity from someone who critically needs work experience, this is a trade-off that we shouldn't be making. And just to show you how important work experience is, economists looked at, uh, they did an experiment. They sent out about 10,000 resumes and tweaked little things on all of them. And they found out that internship experience meant more than what you majored in at school. So if you were an English major who interned at a bank, you were more likely to get a call back for an interview than someone who majored in finance. And the reason I also brought up internships here is it's another funny example of government exempting itself from rules that it doesn't like. So in 2009, the Labor Department made it effectively illegal for <coughs> private companies to offer unpaid internships. But, I mean, this also sounds good, but again, internships are an important thing to hold, uh, to hold as an opportunity for young people. But, as with many other things, the government exempted itself. So you can still go work for President Obama's White House or a congressman and not get paid. But to tie this to the minimum wage, there was the, back when the minimum wage bill was only to raise it to 10, 10 an hour, which I know it sounds reasonable now compared to the fight for 15, but I called each of the sponsors of the bill and I asked them, do you pay your interns? And only one, uh, Bernie Sanders actually, was the one who paid his interns. But, and no one else did, so I asked them why. And they said we couldn't offer as many opportunities. There wouldn't be as many internships if we had to pay these interns. And we're effectively using this as a training step for something that'll pay off later on in their career. We're giving them a chance, and if we have to pay them, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. I'm like, oh great, so you just explained why you no longer want to sponsor the minimum wage bill, right? They couldn't connect the same idea when things, that, when things apply to people in Congress, they start to get it. But when they're looking out on the economy and trying to look out for young people's interests, they just fail to see how many government policies have unintended negative effects. So I just threw out a lot of uh, ways that government's working against your interests. There's a few more I cover in the book that we might get into in Q&A, but I wanted to go into a little bit about the future, how we can get out of this. And I think the main way we need to, uh, the main thing we need to do to restore lost economic opportunity is look at America's regulatory system. Because right now, I, I, if, if any of you have ever looked at the Code of Federal Regulations, if you haven't done it yet, I don't suggest doing so because it's over 175,000 pages long. But these aren't just pages of lawyers rambling back and forth. In it, there's over one million commandments from Washington. And the way to get to this number is look at every time a word such as must, cannot, or shall is used. 
Every time the government's telling an entrepreneur or business owner that they either have to or can't do something. So how can we expect any young